Hi everyone. Today I'm here again for mentoring sessions with Pastor M. And today I'm here for a special set of women. I am so in love with this group of women <laughs> and everyone that knows me knows. So I'm here with my seventh series again, but this time for the married women. So yes, I'm here for my sisters, the married women, the women who have decided to dedicate their lives to partner with God to make one man's life special. So today I'm still going to be talking about mistakes um, that we make, but this time several mistakes that married women make. Let me do a disclaimer. Everything I'm going to say to you today is going to be said from a place of love. I'm with you. I feel you. I know what you're going through. I know the decisions you've made. Um, so everything I say, please don't be angry. Just take the what you need to take and uh, let's still be friends after this. Okay, so I will start with number one. Number one is thinking that you are the project. Yes, so the first mistake that married women make is thinking that we are the project. Thinking that you are the project. That's the very first mistake. And I can't really blame you, to be honest. Um, some of these things, even if I speak in the third person, realize that I'm also talking about myself. Um, I can't really blame you. Some of these things are mistakes I also made. Um, um, so I understand what it's like to get married and think that, you know, everything is going to be about you because, I mean, from the very first, from the very first, um, from the beginning, from the beginning, um, the man chased you, you felt like a princess, he did everything, you know, you made it difficult self sometimes, you call, you won't pick your call, you know, you're doing shakara, you know, <laughs> you're literally just posing for him and uh, he's doing all the chasing, he's taking you out to dinner, he's sending you love notes, he's doing everything he can to get you. Um, then, of course, the wedding day, you know, the whole planning process, everybody's, you know, gushing about you, especially when you got your ring. All of a sudden, your left hand was the only hand you had anymore. So, hair is in You know, all of us had that fake hair. We're always flicking. I'm asking us questions. We're doing that. So, from the engagement to the wedding day, in fact, even the way you walked into the church. When he came in, nobody knows. When you walk into the church, the pastor would say, Let's, can we just rise as the bride walks in with her dad? And you're feeling like a queen, you know. And then you get home. A guy doesn't have time for you anymore. He doesn't call you anymore. <laughs> Everything just suddenly stops. And it can be very infuriating because that's where a lot of women start to complain. All the things you did before we got married, you don't do them anymore. Listen to me. Listen, my darling. You are not the project. Men are project driven. Most men, okay? Most men are project driven. So the reason why he was so invested when it was chasing you and everything is because you were the project. So now he has moved on to other projects. He's moved on to making money. He's moved on to getting a promotion at work. He's moved on to having babies, providing for the babies, building his house. There are many other projects. You were just one of the projects. He has achieved that project. He has ticked that box off and he has moved on. I know it's hard to hear, but it's the truth. Now, there's a solution. There's something you can do to make sure that you still have a happy marriage. And that is you need to quit nagging about, you don't call me anymore, you don't check up on me anymore, you don't tell me I'm beautiful, and join him in achieving his other projects. If you want to stay relevant in a man's life, you have to be in his face, <laughs> okay? So if you know that he has other projects, things he's dreaming about, he wants to build his house, you need to help. Okay, that's what you are here for. Bible says that Adam had work, then God sent the woman to be a help meet. He needed a helper that was suitable for him and adaptable to him, a, a, a helper that was comparable to him. So if you want to stop that, or rather solve that problem of feeling like, oh, I'm, my husband doesn't pay attention to me anymore, then get interested in the things he's interested in. Join him in achieving the next project, okay? So the first mistake we make is thinking we're the project, that the world revolves around us, that his marriage is going to be about us. Listen, marriage is never about what you can get. It's always about what you can give. 
So when, when God made woman, he never said, um, I'm making the woman so she can go and enjoy. That's a byproduct. Of course you expect her to enjoy your marriage. Of course your husband is supposed to be a blessing to you. Of course your husband is supposed to spoil you when he has a chance to. But thinking that you are the sole reason why marriage was set up is going to be a huge disappointment for you. If anything, it can cause you to even get depressed. So you are not the project. Deal with it. Stop acting like you are. Okay, and help him achieve his other projects. So that's the first mistake married women make, thinking that they're the project, that the world revolves around them, that everything should be about them. Move on, okay? Give your husband a break. He has other dreams. He has other goals. You were just one, maybe the major one, that should help him achieve all the others, okay? So number two mistake that married women always make. Like I said, remember, I'm on your side. <laughs> I am totally on your side. So please don't tune off because um, these days I hear a lot of women complain. Everything is about women. Everything is about women. The truth is, um, if you sit there and say everything is about women, what about men? Nothing is going to be done. The Bible says that your own obedience must be complete before you can avenge disobedience. So if you go to God and say, my husband is not doing this, God's going to say, what about you? You know, one of the things God, God taught me this a long time ago. Um, I, I read the story of where Jesus was talking to Peter and was telling him that when you get older, you would be held by the hand and you would die. And, you know, Jesus was describing how Peter was going to die and how he was going to suffer death. And Peter said to Jesus, he looked at Jesus and um, he saw the apostle John, the disciple Jesus loved, you know, sitting beside Jesus and he said, what about him? And Jesus didn't say, uh, this one is going to die. Like, no, Jesus said, what is it to you? What's your business? You follow me. It doesn't matter what he does or what's going to happen to his life. What's important is you, what I'm saying to you. So when you go to God and say, my husband is doing my husband, God will say, you, have you done your bit? Do your own first, then I would fight for you, okay? So the second thing, like I said, is supporting the wrong decision. Married women do this a lot. Hey, he's my husband, what am I supposed to do? You are supposed to tell him the truth. That's what you are there for. You should be the voice of reason in your husband's life. Your husband wants to kill somebody, will you follow him? Your husband wants to steal, will you follow him? So let's stop supporting wrong decisions under the guise of submission. All of a sudden, when submission is, is, you know, is, is a good enough excuse or something we can hide under, then we say, oh, I'm submitting. But if they say submit, you fight. Why must we submit? Why must we submit? Stop supporting wrong decisions. I always jokingly tell my friends, I say bad wife is bad. If a man has a bad wife, it is very bad. A woman that cannot tell him the truth. The man wants to go mad, you support all his decisions. He wants to do this, you say it's okay, you are the best. You're not telling him that this thing you're doing is bad. Stop disrespecting your boss. Stop stealing money from the company. Stop you're encouraging him. Uh -uh. When you're slaving away there, please, because our sons will be blessed. No, look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira. I believe, totally believe, that they could have saved each other's life. If his wife had said to him, this plan that you've come up with, that we should steal the money we promised God, let's not do it though, my hand is not there. If she had said that, she just agreed. Submissive wife. Eh, ah, it's the man said, it's our money. How would they know? How would they know if we don't tell them everything that we, we, we made? And they sold the property. Peter said, when the property was yours, did anybody force you to give us? So why have you lied against the Holy Spirit? He fell down and died. His wife came in a few minutes later. Did you bring all the money that you were supposed to bring? She said, yes, so. Ah, my husband brought everything. They said, ah. I said, listen, the people that went to bury your husband, listen for their footsteps. They are the door. They will carry you out now. She fell down and died as well. Why? Because you are supporting rubbish. If your husband is doing something wrong, be able to stand up for the truth. I hear a lot of my women say things like, Ah, me, I don't want trouble. Oh, me, I want peace. Oh, so I will not tell him. So you will allow him self-destruct. You will allow your husband to make stupid mistakes because you don't want trouble. That's what you are there for. You are there to trouble his trouble. <laughs> you are there to make sure that his life turns out good. I always tell women, listen, you determine the legacy your husband lays for your children. If your husband is doing something wrong and you don't speak up, your sons will see it and say it's okay. Your daughters will see it and say it's okay. Your daughters will think that that's how marriage should be. But if you tell him and find a nice way to tell him, your husband comes up with a crazy decision. Let's not give our tithe or a crazy decision. Let me, I want to plan and steal money from my office. And you say, hey, as far as you don't catch, are you, are you all right? Are you all right? Your job is to support your husband. 
when he's making the right decisions and to correct him when he's not prayerfully and respectfully correct him when he's not. My husband knows I'm the number one person I will tell him the truth. If he lets you squeeze his face on tomorrow, I'll be just be petting him. Sorry now. So I'll not tell you the truth. You don't want to tell you the truth. Oh yeah, sorry now. Oh yeah, come let me kiss you. Oh yeah, come let me pet you. Oh yeah, sorry now. But I've told him oh, he knows I have told him the truth. Okay? So my too many married women do these things. He's he's disrespectful to his parents, you support him. He's maltreating his younger ones, you support him. One day you know, they always say it. I, like I said to you, I grew up around Proverbs a lot. The king, they used to flog the first wife. They've kept it for the second wife somewhere. So you are thinking that, ah, he's dealing with his family. It's not affecting me. And you're not telling the truth. That he's disrespectful. That he's rude. That he's a baby. That he, 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 everybody around him in the office is complaining. When he gets home, you tell him, say, no, they are the problem. How can everybody be a problem except him? You need to tell him the truth. So you're not correcting all these things. And tomorrow... When he decides to use those things on you, you start complaining, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. So wh whatever you are encouraging and enabling, just remember that one day will fall on your side. So as married women, we must make sure that we tell our husbands the truth. We must be the voice of reason. Like I said, you must be respectful, it must be prayerful, but you must always speak up for the truth. You must always, always speak up for the truth. So don't support your husband when he's doing the wrong thing. The third thing, third, third mistake that married women make is the mistake of familiarity. Hey, and this one, eh, everybody is guilty, even me, even me. Let me tell you the truth now, even me. And you know why? It's so easy to fall into that sin of familiarity or that mistake because you are the one person that sees your husband at his lowest when he's in his boxers when he has not brushed his teeth, when he has not had a bath. So he can be a king outside. But when he comes, he's just a boy. You know, just a boy. So you've seen him. You've seen him at his weakest when he's sick and he's crying like a baby. Or when you've seen him at every single point. As in, like Nigerians will say, you've, it's, it's, that's not to see finish. <laughs> you know. And that's exactly what happens. A lot of times, because you've reminded this man for a while, you've seen every, I mean, you've seen every side to him then you forget that you should honor him as your king and as your husband. So you speak to him anyhow, he annoys you, shout at him. Things you would probably not do before you got married. When you get married, you say, what? I've been managing, I've been, I've been managing it since, so I can't take it anymore. No, it's a huge mistake. You know why? Because respect is one of the major needs of every man. Every single man needs respect. Every man wants to be the king of his castle. And the truth is, the king must be venerated. He must be worshipped. Anytime, every single man that I know, every single man wants to be king of his castle. So you can't tell a man in his own house, you just come and you're shouting at him, screaming at him. Every man wants to be treated like a king. And I've learned that if you treat a man like a king, he will treat you like a queen. So most times, because... Um, because we feel that this man, I've, I've lived with him since now, I know him, I can talk to him, and I, it, we forget, we forget that God is the one watching when it comes to marriage. Let me give you an example. When I learned this, I learned this lesson early in marriage. Um, my husband did something, I think it was the first year. Yeah, it must have been the first year, first year of our marriage. My husband did something, I can't remember what it was, but it mustn't have been anything too serious. But I was upset. So um, I went to my prayer room and I was praying, okay, I, let, me, let me be honest. I was supposed to be praying. I was complaining. So I was there complaining. God, I don't know, I'm not going to take this. I don't know. And for the, f I don't know, for the first time, maybe the first time in our marriage, I literally heard the audible voice of God. How dare you? How dare you? It's because I gave you my son. I ran out, as in, I've told this story many times. I ran out of the bedroom like somebody was chasing me. I'm like, what? Like, you must treat him with honor. Do you understand, first of all, that this is your man of God? Ah, I said, okay. See why I don't want to marry a pastor? I don't like problem. But I learned over time that no matter how angry I am with my husband, he can, he can attest to this. No matter how angry I am with my husband, I must first treat him with honor and with respect. I have never, in the 15 years we've been married, I have never raised my voice at him. Has he done things that have annoyed me? Yes. Has he done things that make me even want to disrespect him? Of course. Has he made things that make me want to humiliate him? 
are you kidding me? If you're a married woman, you know that you've experienced every side to a man. There are times where you just want to just press him and let him just press him, you know? Just, they can be very annoying, to be honest. I can't lie to you. And the truth is that, even though he's all these things, he's still my head. He's still my pastor. I tell women every time, you must learn to respect your husband the same way you would respect your pastor. A lot of women who I'm talking Christian women now, you know, a lot of Christian women respect their pastors. No matter what the pastor says, they will say, yes, sir. They will kneel down, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. They would, you know, literally be bowing and, you know, literally almost worshipping the pastor. Meanwhile, when you get home, your husband says something, you shout at him disrespectfully. That was, it's you are talking. <laughs> but this is your own pastor at home. You know, so the same way you would honor your pastor, you should honor your husband the same way. Same way you honor your father, you honor your, your, your husband the same way. But my husband is my pastor, so some other women have it easy. When you're, when you're angry with your husband, you can literally scream at him. I can't, I can't, I dare not. I dare not. He's my pastor, first of all, before he's my husband. So I, I try very hard not to, not to forget that. Even in the Bible, there's this story that is, that should Keep all of us on our toes. Um, the story of Esther starts, it doesn't start from Esther. It starts from a queen called Vashti. Now, Queen Vashti was married to the king, and the king was in charge of all the nations in the east. He was such a, a great king, King, king um, Ahasuerus. He was such a great king. And he sent, his, so he was throwing a banquet, and he had thrown his banquet for days, months, you know. So his, and his wife, too, was throwing her own banquet. I mean, she was a queen in her own right. So in her palace, she, she was hosting her own parties. And then the king sent for her. And she sent a message back to him that she's not coming. At first, I read that story the way everyone reads the story. I just read it like, and she said she's not coming. The king got angry and said, oh, he wants another. And then the wise men advised him, get another wife, banish, the, banish Vashti. Because if other women see that they can treat the king like that, I mean, they, can, they, they will all think they can treat their husbands like that. So the king banished her, and after a while he was sad he did, but he wanted a new wife. They just said, let's bring Esther, and Esther replaced Vashti. I've read that story many times, and I read it like, oh, in favor of Esther, that God just wanted favor of Esther. Listen, if Vashti did not misbehave, there would be no position for Esther. Esther would have married somebody else, and maybe God would have given her, yes, yeah, someone of honor. But if Vashti misbehaved. Vashti, it was this, you know, that familiarity. She too had gotten to the me too, I'm a queen. The king is standing for me to a queen so I can decide. No, no. The king made up his mind at that point to replace her. So your husband may not replace you by marrying another wife, but he may replace you in his heart. So he's not talking to you about very important things. He's not talking to you about sensitive things. You now notice that he's talking more to his friends. He's talking to his brothers. He's talking to his siblings. He's talking to his extended other family members, but he's not talking to you. Check your heart. If you have been treating him with disrespect, a man will simply log out. If he's even a good man, he might not marry someone else. I know some evil men that will just move on. They will vash to you, banish you, and go and look for an Esther, one small fine girl that they can just replace you with. I'm, not, I'm, I'm trusting God that your husband is not that kind. But I'm talking about men who are even Christian and godly. They will just log out. They say anything they want to tell you, shout at them, talk to them anyhow. Men hate this dis disrespect. And that is the mistake married women make. They disrespect their husbands constantly. No matter how annoying your husband is, no matter what you want to tell him, there must be a, a way you can tell him respectfully and prayerfully. Okay. So the next mistake that married women make. This one we're all guilty. So I'm, just, I'm going to look at myself as I'm looking at you. Okay. The next one, number, number four not taking care of ourselves. Let me add, let me, let me speak <laughs> in the verse. Not taking care of ourselves. Married women are the most guilty of this. Not taking care of yourself. Now, this thing is on two levels. First of all, not taking care of your looks. And the truth is that men are moved by what they see. You know, God gave us expo. When um, Samuel went to anoint David, when he got there, he saw the first one. I said, ah, this one is he's tall, he's, he's, he, looks, he looks the part. This must be the one I will anoint king. God said, he's not the one. He said, men look on the outward. He said, I look on the heart. Listen, God gave us expodel. Men look on the outward. Though. Men are not God. God may look inside and say, oh, my daughter has such a kind heart, a gentle spirit. Hmm. Men are into packaging. Men are into see what's on the outside before they look inside. 
they must first be attractive to them. Men are moved by what they see. They are not God. It's God who looks at the heart. A man looks at the outward appearance. Love women get married and relax. They say, oh, he has married me. Before he got married to you, putting your lashes, your makeup, makeup is always on fleek, everything on point. You're doing your hair every two weeks. Now, since he got married to you, you've been wearing hair net. And that hair, you've been carrying for six weeks. You've not washed it once. You are smelling of sweat. And he's just pretending like he's not smelling. You are smelling. If you need to smell your hair, say, hmm, honey, is my hair smelling? If you ask your husband, it's smelling. I'm telling you. He can't tell you it's smelling, but it's smelling. Wash your hair. Even if you're wearing a wig, please, the hair under the wig... We can't see the tracks anymore. The tracks for the cornrow. Everything has merged together. It's now no longer, it's no longer cornrows. It's now farmland, grassland. I don't even know what else to call it. That has merged. The hair you are not doing, you're not washing your hair. By, 12, by 3, 3 p.m., you have not brushed your teeth since morning. You're walking about with wrapper on your chest. Help him. I know your, I know, I know, I know your husband is born again. Oh, my husband is born again. My husband can never cheat on me. Thank you. But must it be under punishment? Thank you that I will not cheat on you, but can't you make it easy for him not to cheat on you? Can't you help the man? So especially <laughs> in this recent lockdown, it has been amazing. I did a Zoom call with married women a few weeks, a few days, well, weeks ago. And I asked everyone to come put their, their cameras on. I almost passed on. I said, wait, 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 wait. Is this what the men are seeing? Ladies, wash your hair today. Please help me put on make. I, I said screaming, they were laughing. They said, Pastor, I was coming. I don't know. You cannot see yourselves. Can you see yourselves? No, you've not had your bath. You've not combed your hair. You're all wearing shower cap. Some of you have face masks on. Some of you have, uh, not face masks, facial masks, no? So the Shelly, Nixodem, you rub all those things up. you white and you're walking about everywhere. You've not brushed your teeth in the afternoon. You're walking about. You are smelling. And the man not saying anything to you because he, doesn't, he knows that if he says it now, you will nag. You will cry. He doesn't want trouble. So he's keeping quiet. But me, I, I'm ready for your trouble. Go have your bath. Stand up from watching this thing. Yes. Pause it. I'll come back. I'll be here. Pause me. 